Hello everyone. I certainly hope that everyone is having a wonderful day and that your week is going really well too. For us, it is an absolutely just beautiful day. And it has been beautiful days all weekend and Monday and today and it's just been really wonderful. The sun is just shining so nicely and the skies are so blue. Anyways, there isn't a whole lot going on around here because my husband is working extremely long hours. I mean, it is feast or famine with UPS freight. Um, yeah, they need to really add back the runs that they had um, stopped. And so what they're doing is they're just having everybody run like mad. I mean, he is every single day at the very, very limit of how many miles he's allowed to even run. And yeah, it's been really hard on him. He's been gone like 12 and 14 hours a day. It's, yeah, it's been really hard. He's really tired a lot. But anyways, I guess, you know, it could be a good thing, right? But so yeah, we're not really going anywhere, doing anything because all that poor man is doing is working and sleeping. Yeah, and he gets up and he works and he comes home and he eats and he sleeps some more and he gets up and yeah, it's just keeps on going. <laughs> but that's what's been going on around here. But I do have to tell you, outside is just so extremely beautiful and the weather, it's not hot. It's, it's, it's warm, but it's not that ungodly, you know, with the humidity that just slaps you in the face that you just want to turn around and go back inside. It's not like that. It's just been absolutely beautiful. So anyways, I thought that I would show you a little bit of the beauty in the blooms. <laughs> I hope that you enjoyed that. I just find the creativity in God's design of his creation to be fascinating. He didn't leave out any little detail. He didn't leave out anything, I should say, he didn't leave anything to chance. And the beauty 
in a little petal. Anyone that looks at the detail of even a flower, I can't imagine how they cannot believe that there was a creator. But anyways, right now I am going to be going over to my neighbors. I have um, some drumsticks that I got that I'm going to give to her because, yeah, Rick doesn't really care for drumsticks and I have like three packs of drumsticks that are four to six drumsticks in each pack. So yeah, we're just going to go ahead and I'm going to take them over to her. And then I'm going to go over to a friend of mine who um, has... Uh, it's a it's a cross made out of grapevine and I ordered this from a lady that goes to our old church and so she went ahead and gave it to this friend to give to me so that my friend lives a lot closer than she does so yeah I'm gonna go scoot and pick up that and that I will show you in a coming up video and yeah I'm not really sure what I'm going to do with it yet, but I sure know I wanted one. Anyways, I hope everybody has a great day, and yeah, I'll talk to you in just a little bit. For today's devotion, we are going to be looking in the book of Matthew. But we're going to be looking at chapter 11, and we're also going to be looking in Matthew chapter 3. And there's a reason for that, and I hope that you'll want to follow along. Have you ever noticed the Bible's willingness to tell the whole truth about people, even when it exposes their faults or makes them look bad? Well, today we're going to talk about doubt and John the Baptist. Now, of all the people, even John the Baptist, had a moment of doubt that Matthew chapter 11 tells us about when he doubted and he wondered about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Now, remember, John the Baptist was Jesus's cousin and he was the Messiah's forerunner and he had baptized Jesus. He recognized him as the Father's anointed one. So now we're going to look in Matthew chapter 3, where John is baptizing Jesus. And as Jesus comes up out of the water, the heavens open up and the Spirit of God descends like a dove with lightning on him. And a voice out of heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I and well pleased. John, who had witnessed such an event as this, now in Matthew chapter 11, who is sitting in prison waiting a death sentence, and he's wondering, is Jesus the Messiah? So he sends some of his disciples to ask him. Now, before I continue, I am going to jump back to Matthew 3 because um, this is going to help us gain some perspective into why John was uncertain and he had some doubts, okay? So starting in chapter 3, verse 7, that's kind of where I'm looking at, and we're going to continue to verse 12, um, he is saying Basically, he's actually, he's not saying, he's telling about how the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming to him for baptism, and he calls them a brood of vipers and asks who has warned them to flee from the wrath to come. And in verse 10, he warns them that the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, and so every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now I want you to listen to verses 11 and 12. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unwinchable fire. This is John's perspective. John expects the judgment of evil or the vindication of holiness at the hands of Jesus, God's Messiah. But this is not happening. Now remember, John is in prison and he's waiting a death sentence. He's waiting for his own execution. And he's hearing about the wonderful works of Jesus, how the blind can see, how the lame can walk, and how people have been raised from the dead. Yet here he sits in prison. Wouldn't it be natural for John to question, to have some doubts? I pondered what John said back in Matthew 3, verse 12, because I think he thought Jesus was going to bring vindication. So where's his vindication? Now, back to chapter 11, and I really hope I'm not confusing you. Jesus answers John's question indirectly with a list of his own miracles. You find that in verses 4 to 5, most of which are drawn from the messianic prophecies in the book of Isaiah. But he does not recite the promises of vengeance that is also found in the book of Isaiah. It is as if Jesus is saying to John, yes, I am the Messiah and my miracles prove it. But the final judgment is yet to come. In the meantime, I will preach the gospel to the poor and redeem God's people. Christ is trying to to help John understand what God's word truly says about the Messiah and to bring his expectations of the Messiah's work into line with what the word says and how the righteous, especially Jesus, must suffer before the kingdom comes in all its fullness. That is Isaiah chapter 53. Like John, we live in an era when the good guys don't always win. Righteous people suffer. Good and godly people get hurt. They get sick. They lose their jobs, their homes, and even their families. And this can lead us to doubt God's promises. But Christ's kingdom is growing. And we look forward to its sure consummation. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 27 and 28. Matthew Henry wrote, The remaining unbelief of good men may sometimes, in an hour of temptation, strike at the root and call into question the most fundamental truths which we were thought to have been well settled. The best saints have need of the best helps they can get for the strengthening of their faith and the arming of themselves against temptations. Let us turn to the word and to other Christians so that doubt does not fester into unbelief. I hope that this has helped someone because sometimes things happen in our lives and we don't understand and the enemy causes doubt into our minds and he places fear in our hearts. And that's when we have to do what John did. We need to ask Jesus for his truth. And we do that by going into his word, by studying his word, and by praying for God to bring to us understanding. God bless. And I'll talk to you next week.